Assalamu alaikum and greetings of peace. Welcome to today's episode of Care on Air. My name is Josefa Shabazz and I serve as the Research and Advocacy Coordinator at Council on American Islamic Relations Care. In today's episode, we will have a virtual presentation by Professor Mark Fatima Massoud of UC Santa Cruz on his newly released book titled Sharia Inshallah, Finding God in Somali Legal Politics. He will discuss the ways in which Somali people have invoked God to uh, oppose colonialism, to resist dictators, expel warlords, fight for gender equality, and build path to the rule of law. We will unpack why faith matters to the rule of law in Somalia and Somaliland, and how it shaped its legal system over the years under colonialism. Moreover, we will discuss how interpretations of Sharia were controlled and contested by different actors for their own political purposes. The presentation will be in two parts. In the first half, Professor Masood will give us a PowerPoint presentation describing the findings of his new book. And in the second half, I'll conduct a question and answer session to learn more about the findings of Mark's research. During this session, we encourage members of the audience to ask questions in the comments section. I now have the distinct honor to welcome on Professor Mark Fatih Masood. Professor Masood is a professor of politics and legal studies at UC Santa Cruz, where he directs the legal studies program and serves as affiliated faculty with the Center for the Middle East and North Africa. He's the author of two really great books. His first book, Law's Fragile State, shows how colonial officials, authoritarian regimes, and international lawyers have used the rule of law to govern Sudan. His second book, Sharia Inshallah, that we will discuss today, investigates the relationship between religious faith and the rule of law in Somalia and Somaliland. Masood is a recipient of Guggenheim and Carnegie Fellowships, and he has held visiting positions at Stanford and Princeton University. In 2022, he will give the Evans Pritchard Lectures at the University of Oxford. Mark, it is a pleasure and honor to have you on. Okay, thanks everyone. And thank you, Josefa, and thank you to CARE uh, for hosting this event today and welcome to, to the people who are participating. Uh, I wanna make sure my screen is being shared right now and people can see this screen share and I see Josefa nodding, so that's great. Uh, uh, you you wanna try, so I'll ask the producer actually to take me off and then you can uh, share your screen. Okay, got it. All right, it looks like the screen is being shared, awesome. Um, so thank you everyone for being here. Uh, I want to talk about my research on the ways that people uh, in the Horn of Africa uh, and, and around the world have used Islam to strengthen the rule of law. I'll speak for about 20 or 25 minutes, and then hopefully feel free to leave some comments in the chat or questions, and then we'll take some questions. And I know Josefa at CARE also has some questions, and I look forward to our discussion. I hope to bring out some of the implications of this research that I did in East Africa for other contexts, uh, given the important role that religious faith is playing in politics in the United States, uh, in Europe, in other parts of Africa, in the Middle East, uh, and in Asia, and across the Americas. Um, so here in the United States, uh, when some people think of the politics of religion, they think about people who invoke religious faith to uh, justify, or even God, people who invoke God to justify uh, violence, extremism, fundamentalism, uh, Al-Qaeda, and the September 11th attacks on the United States. Uh, the Taliban instituting a kind of gender apartheid in Afghanistan between men and women. In Sri Lanka, uh, some Buddhist monks have invoked religious texts to promote uh, religious nationalism, uh, civil war and the killing of Muslims. And earlier this year, uh, in the United States, extremists carried Bibles, crosses, flags that said Jesus 2020, as they stormed uh, the US Congress to stop the certification of President Joe Biden's election. Because of this extremism, religion and especially Sharia has been denigrated. Uh, the Arabic word Sharia is often translated in English as Islamic law. But rather than being a strict legal code, Sharia is more of an ethical code guiding people's behavior, coming from the Quran and the Hadith, which means that different people and different governments have interpreted Sharia over the centuries in different ways. I'd be happy to talk about that more in the Q&A, but right now, 
With few exceptions, many governments and policy analysts see Sharia as a tool of dictatorial control, uh, a means for dictatorships or repressive governments to do things like restrict human rights, uh, oppress women, and persecute minorities. Nearly all 50 US states have introduced bills banning Sharia. The map you see shows the approximately 200 different anti-Sharia laws passed, or sorry, not passed, but introduced across the United States. American senators have publicly called Sharia evil. Uh, the European Court of Human Rights has twice, two times ruled that Sharia is incompatible with European notions of human rights. Uh, even governments in Saudi Arabia, Egypt, and other Muslim majority countries have uh, in a way derided Sharia in their own ways by imprisoning anti-regime activists and labeling them, quote, stealth jihadis who are seeking Islamic law. More broadly than that, uh, beyond Sharia, legal scholars have warned that religious faith itself uh, produces a crisis of law in which, quote, the rule of law and the rule of God are on a collision course because religion offers a credible threat to the liberal constitutional narrative. In other words, religion offers a credible threat to democracy. So religious faith is being seen as this threat to not only dictators, but also to modern constitutional development, to political liberalism, to democracy itself and the rule of law. But my question is an empirical one, and it's relevant to the global policies that we design. Can religious faith build peace? Uh, can religious faith build democracy and the rule of law, especially after a period of war? And more specifically, what does Sharia actually do for colonial administrators historically, for present day uh, governments, for aid workers, for activists? And I traveled to the Horn of Africa to answer this question. So this part of the world, this region is labeled the Horn of Africa because early map makers thought that the region resembled a rhinoceros horn uh, on the map of Africa. Now, this part of the world is not known for any rule of law or legal order, much less an Islamic legal order. Illegal order. Uh, Somalia, which you see here, along with the autonomous Puntland and Somaliland, this part of the world uh, is known in global policy and media for terrorism, pirates, famine, uh, drought. The United States Fund for Peace, a nonprofit NGO, they've labeled Somalia as the first or second most fragile state in the world. And what I found in this context of violence or failure was remarkable. Sharia, religious faith, was thriving as a social and legal foundation for peace. Let me tell you a story. I remember meeting with a young lawyer, uh, we'll call him Tayyib. And Tayyib and I met on a dirt path alongside a courthouse in Somaliland, a little bit like the courthouse you see in this photo. Now the United Nations sees Somaliland as a, as a region of Northern Somalia, but that's not how the people in Somaliland see it. This year, Somaliland is celebrating its 30th anniversary of independence, of autonomy from Somalia. They have a separate currency, a separate education system, a government, a separate judiciary, separate military. For all intents and purposes, they're separate from Somalia, but most other countries see Somaliland as part of Somalia. So I was meeting with this young man, Tayyib. He was in his 20s. We were outside a courthouse and he's sophisticated. Uh, we spoke for an hour in his about his career in the law, um, the cases he was arguing in the courts, uh, the United Nations funded legal aid programs, uh, that he was a part of. And I thought one day Tayyip might become a president or an important global official, like working with the United Nations. And so I asked him, remember he was a young person in his twenties. And so I asked him, what do you wanna do in your life long-term? And then he told me he wanted to stop being a lawyer. And I was confused why he would give it all up. And then he said this, I want to be a sheikh. Sheikhs are religious leaders. They preach obedience to God. They use their understanding of Islamic rules to help people resolve their disputes with one another, disputes like divorce or inheritance or injury or theft. Sheikhs have also preached in public and on the radio and on YouTube to help build peace 
between communities. So my point is that Tayyib, this young lawyer, he always wanted the Somali people to have a peaceful state, but he wanted it to be an Islamic state. And Tayyib is not alone. In many parts of the world, Muslims have also been saying they want to live in Islamic states. In a recent poll, 99% of Muslims in Afghanistan said that Sharia should be the official law of the land. 89% of Muslims in Palestine, 86% of Muslims in Malaysia, three quarters of Muslims in Egypt and Thailand, all said the same thing. And this survey found no variation by gender. So Muslim women were just as likely as Muslim men to favor making Sharia the official law in their countries. And that's the title of my book. It's based on people like Tayyib in Somaliland and others like him around the world who are hoping for Sharia, God willing, inshallah. They have submitted to what they see as the will of God in their struggles for peace, their struggles for justice, their struggles for national identity, their struggles for sovereignty, and their struggles for women's rights. I'm here to tell a different story about Sharia. And in the process, I'll also tell a different story about the rule of law itself as a kind of theology. My main argument to you that's up on the screen, on your screen, is this. People are using religion and religious faith to do what international human rights law should be doing, to build peace and a path to the rule of law. So people who are fighting things like dictatorship or oppression, they don't just have to look outward to international human rights treaties or to the international community for support. These people I met also do look upward to God, to a higher power. So to make this claim that faith in a higher power is guiding people towards the rule of law, towards human rights, I'll do three things in the re remainder of my talk today. I'll discuss my methods. Um, I'll discuss the data and evidence that I gathered for my argument that people are turning to Sharia rather than away from Sharia to build a path to the rule of law and human rights. And then I'll also discuss some theoretical implications for the kind of scholars or, or students in the audience who are interested in the theoretical implications. What does this mean for how we think about religion in politics and the rule of law and democracy building itself? So let me start with my methods. My research questions on Sharia led me to adopt a triangulated methodology. Uh, multi-archival research, uh, qualitative or in-person interviews, and ethnographic observations of real-life activities that were happening uh, in, in the region I was studying. So first I conducted uh, historical research in libraries and archives in the United Kingdom, uh, in Cambridge, in London, in Durham, and in Oxford, as well as at archives in Nairobi and Kenya, and in Hargeisa in Somaliland. Um, the white page you see on the bottom left-hand side of your screen, that's uh, Appendix B of my book in the back of the book. Um, it names the 14 archives in the three countries I mentioned where I collected historical details in the UK, in Kenya, and in Somaliland. So in addition to those archival uh, historical records, I conducted 142 interviews with high-ranking officials, government officials, judges, lawyers, uh, people like Tayyib, who I mentioned, uh, religious leaders, aid workers who worked with the United Nations or other programs, civil society activists. I also uh, conducted ethnographic fieldwork by observing courts uh, and observing workshops where people, international or local aid groups, civil society organizations, organizations like CARE, um, but kind of not CARE itself, but organizations like CARE in that part of the world where they were encouraging state law to flourish. Uh, these photos are of a district court uh, and a workshop on constitutional law and justice, the photos on the right side of your screen. There's one more method I want to mention that not many um, academics or professors talk about. I actually took leave from my job as a professor and I went back to graduate school. I already hold a PhD and I've done all my courses, but I decided to do more courses and more education studying Islamic theology, Christian theology, Jewish theology, the Abrahamic faiths. I'm trained as a lawyer and a social scientist, but if I was going to write about God, I needed to know something more deeply about theology. 
Uh, I came to this research, research on Sharia, as Josefa mentioned, um, as part of my own career journey to understand law um, in, in various parts of the world. My first book that you see here on your screen um, shows how the building blocks of the rule of law, things like stable governments, uh, courts, law schools, prison systems, uh, these are not only the building blocks of democracy, but they can also build colonial or authoritarian rule. And after I wrote this book, exploring these relationships between democratic, colonial, and authoritarian rule, I wanted to learn, beyond trying to build state law, what do people do with their religious faith in politics, and spe specifically around Sharia? And my research reveals the remarkable ways that Somalis have embraced Sharia, uh, which has important lessons for democracy promotion and the rule of law, not only in Somalia and Somaliland, but potentially in many nations where people are pious, including here in the United States. I think, so we often think that, you know, Somalis should learn from the United States example or people in other parts of the world should learn from Europe or the United States. But actually, I wonder if maybe we ought to be learning from what people there are doing. And that's part of what I'm trying to discuss today. So I wrote a chapter of my book, uh, a historical chapter of my book, on how if you care about history, uh, this chapter would be uh, 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 wonderful for you because I wrote about how Somalis invoked Sharia to challenge European colonialism in the early 20th century. Um, but what was, I think, even more interesting than that were the anti-colonial activists, the Somalis who are fighting British colonialism or Italian colonialism, they weren't the only ones thinking about or invoking religion. Colonial records I found in the United Kingdom, they document how British colonial administrators, they weren't Muslim, they never said or never claimed to be Muslim, they were using Sharia, they were using law, a combination of law and religion to govern. I found archival records showing that the British actually brought Muslim sheikhs from other countries to teach the Somali people that Islam permitted European colonial rule. In other words, the way I would phrase it is the British dressed up the ideas of civilization and democracy and human rights and the rule of law in religious clothes in order to convince people that imperialism would be acceptable. Uh, I wrote a different chapter of my book on the post-colonial uh, socialist government of Muhammad Siad Bari. Uh, Mohamed Siad Bari was in power over Somalia and Somaliland in the 1970s and 1980s. And he considered himself a socialist like many African leaders did during the 1970s and 1980s. But even though he called himself a socialist, he still used Sharia uh, in order to maintain a grip on power, kind of like the colonial administration did before him. Um, the quote you see on the screen is one of many examples of Siad Bari saying publicly, that Sharia and socialism were compatible, to try to get Somalis on board with the legitimacy of his unelected rule. Uh, and many of the earliest members of the Somali national movement, uh, which was fighting against Siad Bari's dictatorship uh, during the 19, late 1970s into the mid 1980s, they were guided by a commitment to faith that they saw Siad Bari was destroying um, as he was bombing local towns and killing Somali people. So the Siad Bari government offers an example to us of how dictators, even ones who are maybe not necessarily, they're socialists, they're not necessarily religious, how even they are using religious faith as a source of their authority and as a threat that they have to control and contain. But it's not just colonial administrators and dictators who are using Sharia to rule. Um, the three powerful images that you see on your screen from Getty, these three powerful images show Somalia's parliament approving a national constitution just about a decade ago. And this national constitution proclaimed, it proclaimed Sharia as the source of all law of the land. And you see in these photos, women and men celebrating this decision to impose Sharia in Somalia after decades of civil war. And I spoke with one of the architects of this constitution in Mogadishu, a senior government minister. And he told me he wanted to see an Islamic state rise from Mogadishu's ashes. He said, and I wanna quote, the quote's not on the screen, but I want you just to hear this. He told me, the Somali people 
trust Sharia more than any other law. He said, you have to use Islam to win their hearts and minds and to make the law attractive. He said, you have to use Islam to make the law attractive. Um, elders in Thailand did something very similar where they invoked Sharia to write peace deals in the 1990s and to plant democratic roots without any international assistance. I wrote a chapter of my book on their commitment to Sharia during their reconciliation conferences in the 1990s and again in the 2001 constitution that's still in force today in Somaliland. Uh, research in political science shows that constitutions on average, we tend to think of constitutions lasting a really long time, like hundreds of years, maybe like the American constitution, but on average, constitutions don't last very long, maybe 10, 12, 14 years. The Somaliland constitution is now about 20 years old, surpassing the average. And in it, the Somali people say that Sharia is the basis of all law. Okay, so let me guide you to that top right-hand photo on your screen. Do you see that photo on your screen? It's a photo of women rejoicing and clapping when Somalia's transitional government made Sharia the official law. Let me tell you about some of the Muslim feminists whom I met. So they are regularly invoking the sources of Sharia, verses from the Quran, statements of the Prophet Muhammad, in their struggle against patriarchy. Uh, the national constitutions of Somalia and Somaliland both say that Islam is the basis of all state law. So some of you listening might be thinking, oh, that's why women are turning to Sharia, so that they can bring constitutional court cases, uh, like what legal advocacy groups are doing here in the United States by bringing US Supreme Court cases, groups like the ACLU, groups like the NAACP, groups like CARE, if Sharia is in the constitution, then this would enable um, women to do what activists call, uh, or, or, or scholars actually, legal scholars in my field, they call, they, they call this impact litigation, um, which means you're taking legal cases before the courts to create change in society, not just to like get money or, or win a, a, a reparations for your, for your specific uh, injury, but actually to win reparations or, or take cases to create social change um, across society. Um, not exactly. This is not what women feminists, uh, feminist Muslims whom I met in, uh, in that part of the world in Somalia and Somaliland were doing. When I asked one civil society activist why she works for women's rights, she didn't say she wanted to bring Supreme Court cases. She said, and I quote, I do this because I'm Muslim. Every step I take is based on my Islamic religion. It's part of my motivation. If I wanna to go to my job, if I wanna have a normal life, it's all based on my Islamic religion. So what were the things women were doing to fight patriarchy, to push for gender equality? They were citing the Quran and the Hadith to support women's health, to support girls' education, to support young women in sports, to support women in parliament, to run for office in parliament. The women activists I met were pious, they believed, but they also turned to Sharia out of strategy. When women activists I met talked about human rights, they told me that people thought they were, quote, promoting an alien agenda from the West. Uh, civil society organizations I met with um, when I did my field work there, they talked about human rights. I saw them talking about human rights to their foreign donors um, or their associates who came from other countries. But on the ground with one another, um, they told me they couldn't be seen to be supporting international discourses of law or women's rights. One woman said simply, and this is the quote on the right side of your screen, one woman said simply, patriarchy will not end unless we promote how we are all Muslim. So what you're seeing is a pattern across my historical research. All of these activities, resisting colonialism in the 19th century, fighting dictatorship in the 20th century, building peace and national identity and struggling for women's rights in the 21st century. These are all critical steps on the path to the rule of law and to building democracy, stable democracies. And people are taking those steps with God and with religious faith at their sides. Okay, let me spend the last few minutes. I said I wanted to spend the last few minutes um, for the kind of academics or students in the audience. Um, and I know there are some of you here. 
to talk about the theoretical implications of my work as a legal scholar, um, building what I would call a kind of socio-legal theory of religion and thinking about the rule of law, not as something secular, but as a kind of theology in itself. My evidence across 150 years of Somali history shows the ways people use their faith in a higher power to build a path to the rule of law. I saw firsthand how religion undergirds the law and how religion facilitates the way people dissent from the law, the way people practice maybe what we would call in the United States civil disobedience. Uh, British colonization imported views of Sharia from Mecca, from Sudan, and even from London. Uh, Post-colonial governments, like the dictatorship I mentioned of Mohammed Siad Bari, they tried to use and also to stifle the power of religion. And people today have used Sharia to further a national identity and women's rights. And more generally, my findings help me to see these kind of parallels between religious faith on the one hand and secular rule of law uh, on the other hand. So I've been talking about this concept of the rule of law. Um, and let me see if I can define it more concretely for you. Um, in, in the ways lawyers and international lawyers like me think about the rule of law, the purpose of the rule of law is to limit arbitrary power, to, to limit the power of our governments, to make sure no leader makes arbitrary decisions, that every state leader, whether you're Biden or Trump or Obama or Bush or Clinton, or that every state leader, or any future president of, Amer of the United States or of any country or any leader of any country, that they don't see themselves as above the law that they submit to the authority of the law, that they're working for the law. That's the rule of law at its core. But what I learned in my research is people don't just submit themselves to the rule of law or to their power, to the power of law, they submit themselves to the power of God. They see God, not themselves, as the ultimate source of authority. So the paradox of the rule of law is very much like the paradox of religion, and that is that law and faith rely on the operative concept of submission, that our leaders will submit themselves to these non-human entities, religious faith or, or law, the written code of law, that, that we believe can and should set limits on human behavior. So here I am before you, a lawyer, a professor of international law, a class I'm going to be teaching in just a couple of hours, actually, to 170 students just a few hours from now. Here I am talking with you, not about the importance of international law or treaties, but about the importance of God. What this means for those of us who care deeply about achieving the rule of law is we cannot just focus our attention on human rights or legal reform or the tools that we learned or that my colleagues and I teach to students. We may have to refocus our lens onto religion and faith. Now, for scholars of religion, for religious activists, this is not new. But I'm trained as a human rights lawyer, and it's difficult to tell human rights lawyers that just as they experience a sense of hope from human rights treaties, the people they want to help may find hope in religious faith because they see God as a more meaningful force, a more meaningful force for justice, or they see God as a more meaningful source of justice than human rights itself. So maybe what we need in our global policy and development community is not more law, more legal cases, more litigation, more legal reform. Maybe potentially what we need is a little more religion, a little more faith. Or as the legal philosopher, the great legal philosopher, perhaps one of the greatest legal philosophers of the 20th century, his name was Ronald Dworkin. And in his last book, that was published a few months after he died. And he wrote this book just a few months before he died. He finished the book and he wrote, and I wanna quote from his, his final book. He wrote, we need a religious attitude to life. We need to believe, even if we don't believe, he said, we still need to believe that we've made something good in our lives in the face of death. Thank you. I look forward to comments, questions uh, about this hope in Sharia, inshallah. Thank you so much, Mark, for providing that fascinating overview of your findings and inspiration for, for the book. Uh, we'll now transition into the question and answer portion. I have a set of questions that I'd like to uh, ask you, and I encourage members of the audience to 
please drop their questions uh, in the comments section. So uh, Professor Masood, I, I wanna backtrack uh, a, a little bit and really uh, learn more about, uh, you know, before you had decided to write this book, you know, what was it that really sparked your initial interest in studying Sharia as a, as a legal system and, and, and Somalia in particular? I know you talked about uh, your former book, but you know, out of all the things uh, you know, legal scholars work on, not many choose Sharia. So I, I'm really interested in learning about that uh, decision. Thanks for the question uh, on you know what sparked this initial interest in, in studying Sharia and studying this region of the world, this very important region of the world. Part of it is um, I was conscious of at the time I I've been working on this book project. You know I spent nearly ten years working on it, doing the research, going back and forth, traveling to the region, writing the book. Um, what sparked my initial interest uh, was trying to understand not just the importance, uh, you know, as a, as a legal scholar, not just the importance of law in the making of nations. I realized that even before we think about the law, the law has its foundations in something bigger than the law. And that's not something we think about as legal scholars. Um, some do, but a lot don't. We think of the law or the constitution as kind of the, that's the foundation. But even at the basis of our United States constitution is a kind of religious, uh, uh, a, almost a religious sophistication or a religious sensibility uh, at the mm -hmm. basis of constitutions across the world, not all countries, but in a lot of countries. And I wanted to understand that in, 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 the, in, the, places, in, in the places I cared about, especially in, in, in different parts of Africa. Um, and I wasn't able to ask those questions with my first book that really focused on the law. And I wanted to think about sort of what undergirded the law, what was the foundation of the law. And that led me to study the, these topics um, in a place mm -hmm. where uh, and I wanted to go to sort of what Western scholars would see at the, as the most extreme setting, a state that's been cracked apart and there's an, right. you know, a, 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 an independent nation of Somaliland and Somalia itself has been struggling to form a stable government for the last you know, 30 years since, it's, yeah. uh, since the, the, the dictatorship fell and, and, and the dictator fled the country in 1991. Hmm. Um, I wanted to understand, even in this extreme setting, how are people living and thriving? Hmm. What's helping them? in their daily lives. Right. And the more I talk to people, the more I realize it's not necessarily the law. It's, it's this combination maybe of law, but also what's facilitating the law, religious faith. And if I could just say one more thing in response to your question, mm -hmm. that is as I was doing the research for this book, I ended up reading a lot of early American history. Now you might be wondering, I thought this was a book on Somaliland and Somalia. Why were you reading American history? Well, if you read, various books about American legal history. What you find is, and I, there was a fantastic book by a Stanford University law professor named um, Lawrence Friedman. This book was nominated for a Pulitzer Prize back in, I think, 1974 when it came out. It's called The History of American Law, History of American Law. And if you read it, I mean, you might as well rename the title to a History of American Christianity because right. judges, as America was being formed, in the 18th, as the United States as a nation was being formed, um, uh, judges in courthouses across, as the United States was sort of moving westward and displacing, of course, um, the indigenous and Native American communities on whose land the United States now sits, as the United States was moving westward, um, was judges who were in control of local towns. And these oh. judges used the maxim consistently. They said things, if you look at the archival records, they said things in their judicial opinions. They said, Christianity is part of our common law. Christianity is part of our common law. They literally inscribed religion into the foundation of the United States as the United States moved westward. These are similar things to what I found in Somalia and Somaliland. Judges were saying, Islam is part of our law. Islam is part of our law. So the parallels are rather striking between the foundation and, and, and the security of early American um, identity with mm -hmm. the foundation and security of identity in Somalia and Somaliland, and indeed in many other nations. Right, right. Absolutely. absolutely. Thank you. Thank um, you. Um, and um, and the, I think the second question, the second question I'm interested I'm in, interested in. I, I don't know, I hear an echo. Uh, sorry about that. So the second question I have is, uh, you know, towards the beginning of your book, uh, you mentioned your, your research methods and you cited that, you know, you had concerns for, for safety uh, when conducting uh, research on the ground. And, you know, you conducted, you said, 142 uh, interviews. Uh, 
Um, and so I'm, I'm really interested in learning about, you know, what were some of the challenges uh, you faced when conducting uh, this ethnographic research? You know, how difficult was it, for example, to obtain access to old documents, such as the letters you had mentioned between, you know, Sheikh Hassan and, and British colonial uh, officials? Yeah, thanks for the question about research methods. I really, I actually teach a, a course to PhD students on research methods, and it's something I care about a lot in terms of how to do this kind of intensive historical work, but also historical work that lends itself to understanding kind of where we're at in the present day, to laying this historical groundwork, to thinking about, you know, where Somalia and Somaliland are in the present day, and even comparatively what this means for how we think about religious faith um, in other countries across the world. Um, the archival research, most of the archives I gathered were in the UK. Um, British colonial administrators were, were meticulous record keepers, and many of them kept their, left their papers um, at Durham University, at Oxford University. Um, the Cambridge University Center for African Studies has some old books um, mm -hmm. from the 1950s and 60s, so I went there. Um, and then also the British Library in London has a lot of records as well. So it's a matter of scouring those records, going in, um, taking a lot of notes, recording mm -hmm. like where I found, the, you know, so that, you know, people read it. The, the, the book is heavily footnoted. I think the chapters have, you know, it, it's a book that I hope is readable, I think is readable to, to yeah. most people, but it is heavily footnoted so that people can go back and find those records themselves and continue this process of developing knowledge, of, of developing knowledge um, around these issues and around these concerns. In terms of the interviews, I, I should say that people were extremely welcoming to me, um, people in this environment. They knew, I myself initially come from Sudan. I wrote my first book, as I said, on Sudan. Uh, people there were welcoming to me. Um, uh, my parents left Sudan when I was a small child uh, in the early 1980s, and they never returned to Sudan, but I returned um, to do my research for my first book. Um, and many Somalis I met uh, when I was doing the research for this book, for Sharia, insha'Allah, mm -hmm. um, they, they, some of them called me, um, I, I received two, two names. Some of them called me a cousin because I was from Sudan. Um, and others called me Dalmar. Dalmar is a Somali word uh, for traveler uh, because of all the places I had been and studied and done research. Uh, and I, I, very much those are parts of my identity. So, so people, so I, you know, doing this kind of research, relies, it, you have to be persistent. Yeah but it relies on the goodwill and the thoughtfulness and the care and the energy of other people. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I have I, uh, many books, they end their books with the acknowledgements. They thank, you know, their editors and they thank other people who help them. Mm -hmm. My book starts with those acknowledgements. It's, I think it's important to, to, to mention the gratitude first before mm -hmm. I share what I've done. I share that I could not have done this without the support of many, many, many Somali people and others mm -hmm. who helped me along both from the start of the research um, to the time the book was published. So I'm ever grateful for all those people um, across the region in Kenya, in Somalia, in Somaliland uh, who helped me with this work. And, and speaking of interviews, um, I know you touched on this a little bit in, in the beginning of the, the first half of the presentation. Was, was there a particular person that had stuck out to you uh, in, in your interviews, uh, one that you remember uh, that really stood out and maybe you want to reflect on that a little bit? Yeah, so I, I did a number of interviews, as I said. There, there, there are so many I could think of, just various people who, um, who took on a kind of educational role with me, like trying to explain to me, this is our history. Please, you know, like let the world know about our history, our history of law, our history of politics, our history of engagement with the international community, our history of Sharia, and, and the ways that we see it as not just something that, that we believe, but something that um, can help us in... in in activism, in governance, uh, in politics. Um, I met one person uh, in Somaliland who I think may have been the last surviving member of the British colonial administration, a wow. Somali who worked for the British colonial administration. He had the very tricky task of um, being a dispute resolver. The British um, wanted to hire local Somalis who they saw as kind of quote unquote legitimate people hmm. to resolve people's disputes, to keep the peace. So he was one of those people, um, uh, an akal, it's, it's called, descended from the uh, Ottoman uh, period, this, this word akal. In English, I would probably spell it A-Q-I-L, akal. Yeah. Um, these people of knowledge, people of wisdom who resolve disputes. Um, 
But he also, the British also conscripted him to collect local taxes from people. So that was a lively interview talking with him about how, you know, like he would lose his job if he didn't collect taxes on behalf of the British administration from people. So he had to convince people on the one hand, not only the importance of religious faith and in resolving their disputes, but also like, by the way, you have to pay your taxes to the British government because there are colonial, you know, administrators here. That, that, that's, that's very fascinating. And, and you wouldn't expect to, to find that. Um, and so I think, you know, that's a great transition into talking about some of the content uh, within the book. And so uh, I'm interested, uh, you know, how different actors in British Somaliland, as you mentioned, you know, bended the Sharia for, for their own political purposes. And so one thing that stood out to me in particular uh, were, while reading your book were the colonial administrators who were uh, inserting and battling uh, to uphold their own versions uh, of the Sharia. And so can you talk about, uh, you know, what, what those contesting battles of interpretation looked like uh, and what impact did it have on anti-colonial activists who lived under British rule? Yeah. Uh, so the question is around, you know, this, this I, I, I interpret the question around this, uh, um, this period in the early 20th century, really around 1900 and 1920. So I'm going to geek out for a minute just as a historian and talk about Somali history. But bear with me because it's important. It's important um, for how we, because history is what shapes the, you know, the present that we live in today. So I really care a lot about history. Um, but I didn't realize at the time I would, I was starting my research, just how important the history was. So there was a, a man, a religious leader, a sheikh uh, named Sayyid uh, Muhammad Abdullah Hassan. And Sheikh Hassan was uh, an important leader, an orator, uh, a judge, a decision maker, um, a warrior, a poet. Um, there have been many books written about him. And um, the British actually, in, in, the, in the beginning days when the British were first colonizing this part of the world, um, they actually liked him. They were friends. They thought he was a good person because he was keeping the peace. He was, whenever there was a problem between local communities or a dispute that could rise to the level of, you know, war, um, he would resolve it. And so he earned a lot of authority and legitimacy and power that way. And the British were happy because he was keeping the peace and the British wanted things to be stable so that they could, you know, use their trading networks across the Gulf, Gulf of Aden. The British had an outpost across the Gulf of Aden in Aden, what's now present day Yemen. Uh, and Sheikh Hassan over time started seeing himself more like a religious leader. Uh, and then he started preaching against colonialism. He started preaching against colonial rule. Mm -hmm. uh, and the British were not happy with this. So they launched an all out war uh, against him and against his, uh, against his uh, followers. Mm -hmm. uh, and so it was sort of the British, British administrators and their militaries and, and local kind of we would call them tribes or clans, um, uh, and Sheikh Hassan's followers and their tribes and their clans. Um, and lots of people have written about this war in, in, uh, in, the early in the early 20th century. What I found most interesting from accessing the archives is it wasn't just a war of weapons. It was a war of words where, and I have this documented in the book, there were these letters exchanged between Sheikh Hassan and his followers and between the British and their um, Muslim kind of elites who were uh, uh, kind of helping the British in their colonial enterprise. And they were, it was a war over what the meaning of Sharia was. And Sheikh Hassan would say things like, you know, why don't you come to me and I'll teach you what Sharia really is. And they would say, you know, no, you don't understand. Sharia is not this. Sharia allows, basically Sharia permits colonial rule. And he would say, you know, why would Sharia allow this? Why would Sharia allow one group of people to colonize another, another nation and not allow it to be a nation? when that country itself is, sees itself as a nation. Uh, so he was one of the earliest nationalists and he used religion as a source of his authority. Now, the war was messy. A lot of people were killed. It, some, some estimates suggest up to um, 25 or 30% of the Somali population was killed uh, between 1900 and 1920, ultimately when Sheikh Hassan died, presumably of malaria or flu influenza um, at the time. Uh, but what, what was interesting for my purposes is all along this kind of hot war, there was almost a cold war of words over what the meaning of Sharia is and how to involve it in governance. So just as you said, Josefa, there's always this kind of back and forth between people who are debating uh, what is Sharia, what are its proper meanings, how to use it in politics, 
And sometimes even colonizers get involved in that debate. And even today, um, lots of people are involved in that debate, Muslims and non-Muslims. Absolutely. And those letters that you mentioned were really fascinating to me when I was reading the book because, you know, I haven't actually seen something like that within the book and actually have that have that in front of you. And you also mentioned the, uh, you know, the, the British were recruiting um, imams from Mecca to actually discredit uh, interpretations of the Sharia by uh, uh, anti-colonial activists. And so, oh, sorry, by uh, Sheikh Hassan. And so uh, that was very um, fascinating to see without your book. And I really appreciate that. And Another thing I really appreciate about your book is how you showcase uh, the rich history of Sharia and debunk this idea that, you know, Sharia doesn't play a large role in the lives of everyday Muslims. When in fact, you know, Sharia came to matter immensely uh, in colonial Somalia. Um, and so, you know, can you talk a little bit over, uh, can you talk a little bit about the control over uh, Sharia discourse and, you know, why is it so significant as we see in the exchanges between, between Sheikh Hassan and, and British officials? Uh, you know, despite being a colonial power, you know, why did the British want to claim to be the correct interpreters of the Sharia? Yeah, the British were claiming that they, I mean, they, yeah. they wouldn't have the audacity to claim that they themselves were the correct interpreters of Sharia, okay. but rather they brought in other Muslim sheikhs from, as you said, from Mecca, from Sudan and others to tell Sheikh Hassan that his interpretation of Sharia was incorrect. Mm -hmm. Similarly, like I said in, in the talk, um, Siad Bari, the, the socialist leader in power in the 1970s and 1980s. He was trying to tell religious leaders that his interpretation of Sharia was the correct one. Um, there's a story that I'll mention. It's not a story. It's an actual historical events. In 1975, Siad Bari, the socialist leader, passed a, a, a very lengthy family law. Um, and in, in, in the family law, I think 1974, 75 was the United Nations Year of Women. There was a lot of activity um, the, the convention against the, the convention um, uh, against all forms of discrimination against women, the CEDAW convention on the elimination of all forms of discrimination against women um, was recently passed. And, uh, you know, there was a lot of excitement around women's rights in that time in many parts of the world, including in Muslim majority areas. And Siad Bari passed this family law um, by decree. He was a, a, essentially a dictator. He passed the family law by decree. And, um, a number of sheikhs, religious leaders, um, it, it was passed, I think, on a on a Monday, or um, and then the following Friday at the at the masjid at the main mosque in Mogadishu, a number of religious leaders spoke out against this family law because it had a certain view of gender equality and gender rights in inheritance mm -hmm. that religious leaders said was not right. They said, you know, we should have been consulted. This is against Islam, um, and. Siad Bari, and so they penned a letter to Siad Bari, and he received the letter, and he called them all in and said, you know, come in, I'll be happy to discuss with you. And then he had them all arrested. And then he had, I, I, there were like 30 of them. Um, a number of them were sentenced to life in prison, and about 10 of them, historical records are a little inaccurate. Some say 10, some say 12. I managed to get the names, I think, of 10 of them. So at least 10 were executed by the Siad Bari government, ostensibly for disagreeing with the idea of gender equality, for disagreeing with the idea of women's rights. Um, so a very stark episode in the history of, of Somalia and also in the history of women's rights, such that when I talk to women's rights activists today, in femin Muslim feminists in that part of the world today, they tell me things like, what, that people tell them, oh, are you, are you trying to do what that dictatorship did? Are you trying to kill religious leaders? by promoting gender equality. So this history of uh, the killing of these religious leaders when a socialist dictator promoted uh, women's rights um, is coming back almost to haunt women's rights activists today um, because uh, if, they, if they're seen as, as trying to promote or push for gender equality, people say, are you trying to push for a dictatorship too? Is that what you want? You know, we right. saw how that happened. Right. So that pushes them away from advocating for human rights and advocating potentially for dictatorship and towards advocating for Sharia, to see a connection between Sharia and women's rights. Right. And to make that, that I, Absolutely. And I do actually have a question, a question in terms of the women's activism and women's rights. I realized I skipped over one question I did want to ask you about. Um, you mentioned Italian Somalia uh, and, and British Somaliland. Could you kind of talk about uh, briefly about the um, how the two different how, how both how, how the two were different in incorporating their Sharia into the legal systems. 
Yeah, they were actually quite similar in terms of the ways that they use Sharia to kind of legitimize their own rule. So the area that's currently known as Somaliland um, in the north of the Horn of Africa was colonized by the British. And the area that's currently kind of understood as Somalia, where Mogadishu, the capital is, some, some uh, policymakers in the West call it South Central Somalia. Um, this, was, this region of the world was colonized by the Italians. They had different modes of colonization. The Italians saw Somalia as a settler colony. Um, there was a population explosion in Italy in the 19th century, um, and they needed to put Italians somewhere else. And they said, oh, we'll put them in this beautiful region of Africa. It's along the coast, a beautiful part of the world, beautiful coastline, beautiful beaches. Uh, the Italians settled. Um, many of the men there um, uh, married Somali women. They started with trading companies. Um, and then the Italian government kind of took over at different points uh, in the early 19th century. Sorry, early, yeah, late 19th century, early 20th century. In the North, the British had a different project. Um, they mm -hmm. made deals. The British made deals with various Somali elders saying, we won't marry Somali women. We won't interrupt your local affairs, even though they kind of built a superstructure over the local affairs and hired people to collect taxes, like the one person I mentioned whom I interviewed. Um, they said, we'll try, we'll try and, uh, it's called indirect rule. We'll try and uh, allow you to do what you need to do. And we'll still kind of rule you indirectly. Um, uh, a very different project from what the Italians were doing was more of a direct rule and intermarrying with Somalis, et cetera. Uh, so the British signed these uh, agreements, uh, and I have evidence of these agreements. I have uh, citations to them in, in, in chapter two of my book on the colonial administrators. Uh, essentially, the British just wanted to trade. They, the Somalis had goats, sheep, livestock that they wanted in order to feed their military outpost in Yemen. So they said, if you could just enable trade, we'll protect you from like communities who you disagree with. Um, and, and if you pay taxes and we'll help you resolve your, your disputes, et cetera. And that was a common British project. They did this in what's currently present day Southeast Asia. They did this in Sudan, where I come from. They've done this in other parts of the world as well, this form of indirect rule in Nigeria. Absolutely, absolutely. And, and I wanna um, tra transition to, sorry, I hear that echo again. I'm not sure where, that, where that's coming from. Um, so you talked about, you know, women's activism towards the you know, end of your book. Um, and you mentioned a conversation you had with uh, university lecturer uh, Asha, uh, who's an expert in Islamic law. So maybe uh, you know, can you talk a little bit about that conversation and, and then the importance? Uh, as you mentioned a little bit, in, you mentioned a little bit in the first half, but the importance of the role of uh, Somali women in generating uh, religious knowledge in, in Somaliland's history. Yeah, I met a number of women in, in the book. I talk about one in particular. I open a chapter with a story about this particular woman who, in in many countries would be considered a religious leader herself, a sheikha, um, because of, you know, she memorized the Quran at a young age. She memorized thousands of verses of hadith. She studied these things. She had teachers and instructors in different countries, extremely knowledgeable. But because of her gender, she can't be seen as a religious leader. Now, it's very different from Sudan, say, the country I come from, where um, as early as the 1960s, women were interpreting Sharia as state court judges, as Islamic court judges uh, in the 1960s. Uh, it's not that one country is any kind of better Muslim or not. It's just different interpretations of Islam, different interpretations of Islam. In Somali society, it tends to be a little more conservative around the role uh, than, than Sudanese society around the role of women in, in the interpretation, in the public interpretation of Sharia. Um, that said, though, women I met were, were doing a lot to work with religious leaders, male religious leaders, um, to kind of get them to see that, um, that Sharia does support, in, in, the women's, in the women's views, that Sharia does support uh, the rights of women around health, uh, around bodily integrity, uh, around education, um, that the, there are verses of the Prophet Muhammad um, that, that showcase uh, the importance of educating. There's an, uh, an African and an Islamic proverb, you know, the, um, if you educate a woman, or sorry, if you educate a girl, then you educate a family and you educate a nation. Um, and so women's rights organizations were using this religious and African, so this cultural and religious proverb to showcase to religious leaders and others, hey, don't forget, you know, women's education is really important. It's really important because when you educate a girl, you're ultimately educating an entire nation. 
because women are often carrying the burdens um, that, that men are not carrying. Um, and so these constant reminders for a more expansive interpretation of Sharia are coming from many women's rights activists as they continue to learn. And I think, um, you know, the more people have access to, uh, you know, things like YouTube and, th you know, the more they can learn from various sheikhs and indeed put themselves on platforms um, to expose and, and get other people to think about uh, and talk about um, the fact that there are different interpretations of Sharia. Sharia is divine law. It comes from God. No one's going to doubt that. But the interpretations are different. And indeed, Islam demands that. Islam requires that people interpret Sharia in different ways because, as you know, Josefa, there are many schools of Islamic law uh, over, over uh, Islamic history. They've coalesced even in Sunni Islamic law, let alone if we talk about Shia Islamic law, they've coalesced into four different schools. Those four schools disagree on many matters. It's not that they think that some are more Muslim than others. Mm -hmm. They are Muslims together um, and right. they disagree. And that's part of the project of a lived tradition of religious faith, is this consistent disagreement and this consistent working towards um, using religious faith to better our lives, to make ourselves better people, to live ethically, to live less judgmentally, and to live in peace with one another. Absolutely, and, and well said. We, um, that was the last question that I had from my set of questions. Uh, there is one, uh, question that we can that we can take from the audience in the last one minute or so so uh there's a question do do anti-sharia initiatives effective upend the fundamentals of, of state law yeah so the, there as i mentioned in the talk and i know care has been studying this there's another institute at uc berkeley called the othering and belonging institute and islamophobia research center that have been studying these anti-sharia laws or anti-foreign or anti-international um, bills that are being um, introduced across uh, local governments and state legislatures across the United States uh, and in other parts of the world. And to understand, to understand these, um, I don't think they're upending the way we understand law. I think they're, you know, they're a form of populist politics um, to use, you know, the, the latest group of people that people have been against for, you know, uh, I remember interviewing people for a different research project I have people, Muslims in California, actually, and the way they were talking about, you know, it was Jews, it was African-Americans, and now it's Jews and African-Americans, then it was Jews and African-Americans and Muslims. And, you know, and, and to find groups of people who uh, scholars would say they racialize them, they see them as others, they see them as minorities, they see them as different, and they fear them, and they fear this kind of infiltration that, that these people are, you know, bringing alternative values that threaten American democracy when actually that's not at all the case. Many Muslims in America are actually living Sharia principles um, in the same way that Martin Luther King Jr. lived Christian pr principles to fight against what they see as injustice in society. Professor Masood, I'd like to thank you for coming on to Care on Air and teaching us about the rich and important history of Somali legal politics. And we look forward to hosting you again in the future. Thanks for having me. For our audience, thank you for tuning in. We are dropping two links in the chat to purchase Professor Masood's book, Sharia, Inshallah. You can purchase the book by going to cambridge.org slash inshallah or through amazon.com. Both of those links, again, are in the chats and you can go and use the discount code Masood21 when going to cambridge.org slash inshallah for a discount on the book. As a reminder, KR on Air is live every Thursday at three o'clock Eastern time. Thank you all for tuning in, and we look forward to a new program next week. Until then, peace be with you, and assalamu alaikum.